Good morning, Living Water. How we doing on this Memorial Day weekend? Not the greatest weather, right? Not what we wanted. We wanted to be outdoors, but you know, that's okay because Memorial Day weekend isn't so much about the weather. It's about something else that's far more important. And we just want to honor those who have served in our armed forces. Can we give a round of applause for those who have served for us? We really appreciate you here at Living Water. We really do. So here's what I want everyone to do. We're going to go ahead and stand up. We're all going to worship together.
about that in just a second, but in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, this is for you. You are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonder 
throughout the world. You are set apart. You are a priesthood, chosen kings of a spiritual nation. That nation is a freedom. That nation is a victory. That nation is the kingdom of God. And so here's what I understood about that verse this morning as I read it. It has great impact in our worship for right here and right now. Because your worship is all about a spiritual nation, about proclaiming truth. I mean, we just said about like talking about a banner that we had and the name of Jesus that we have. Well, what we're doing when we worship, when we open our mouth, when we say the words that I am chosen, I am yours, God, I live in freedom, I live in victory, I proclaim that I am a conqueror, you are putting a stake in the ground and you are saying, I take this ground in Jesus' name. That's what's actually happening in that spiritual nation, in that spiritual realm. I mean, we may not see it physically manifest here, but here's what else happens is when, when we start to worship, when we start to see, see, see around us and we hear the voices around us, when, we, when you see someone put up their hand in worship, I'll tell you what's happening. There's a battle that's being won in that moment. There's a victory that's being had in that moment. As you worship, as you release praise in this praise, as you release what's inside of you, you're taking back ground. You're claiming the victory in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's worship together. For you are good, God. We claim this in Jesus' name.
there's something that he's sharing with me and this week the concept I heard this word in the scripture it was broadcast that we are broadcasting the glories of God the name of Jesus Christ that when we sing together we broadcast the idea there's a in my father's house there's a place for me I am who God says I am that when we live our lives outside of this place we're broadcasting the message of Jesus and we look in his word we're learning when we when we give we give so that living water can be a place that broadcasts this message. And so thank you for your giving. But more than that, thank you for being faithful to God, being willing to sacrifice, being willing to give significantly because it impacts the kingdom. So would you pray with me as we get ready to, to, to receive our offering? God, we want to broadcast your name. We want to sing it. We want to say it. We want to live it. We want to give toward uh, the furthering of your kingdom, whatever that might look like, God. We want to be your people. We want to proclaim the truth. And right now, I just proclaim that truth, that we are who you say we are, Jesus. We're chosen and we're yours. We're your children. God, it is my prayer that today would be transformational for all of us, another step forward in our walk with you. And I pray, Jesus, that you take every dollar that's given, use it to advance your kingdom. May, may living water bless you and bless the world through you. And we all pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said... Hey, you may have a seat as we begin to receive our offering. Amen, amen. Hey, in case we haven't met, again, my name is Taylor, um, and I, I don't work here. I've had that question before. I don't actually work at the church. I'm just a regular attender like you guys. But I wanted to announce a couple of things, a few things coming up that us as a church that we get to participate in. The first one is, is bingo night. Now, bingo night is actually pretty cool. Uh, it's run by the students because the students have a mission trip coming up. They're going to New Orleans to help repair some stuff after hurricane season. They get to actually be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so this is your opportunity to get involved with them. And about nine years ago, I was on a similar type of mission trip. And because of that mission trip, I ended up becoming a follower of Christ. So this is a powerful moment for students to get to experience what God is doing and get to be a part of his kingdom and be the hands and feet of him. So if you want more information about Bingo Night, you can check out the Living Water app or you can stop at the info desk out on your way out. Second thing, I'm wearing the shirt for it, the Aruna Run. How many Aruna Runners are there in the room? A few of you, right? I love the Aruna Run because it stands for something way bigger. The Aruna Run is a partner with the Aruna Project, which rescues women out of the sex trafficking industry in India. And I'm telling you, it's powerful. The lives of these women get changed because of the money that we raise just running three miles or so, or walking in your case. In many cases, there's lots of walking. But anyway, getting to be a part of that is huge. And I'm so excited about that. That's coming up this Saturday. If you wanna sign up, it's not too late. There's a table out in the lobby to be a part of that. And the last thing I wanna talk about is car care. 
one of the ways that we get to serve our community here in Dalton and Oroville is we do car care. So if you're interested in helping out with that, you can sign up to be a volunteer at the table out in the lobby or you can check out more information on the app. So last thing, what I want you guys to do is stand up one more time, find three people, and since it's Memorial Day weekend, it's time to talk about summer. So ask them, what's their big summer vacation if they have one planned? from a little nap, it's a little dark, but you guys silly? I'm still gonna send it. <laughs> Don't be silly, we're still gonna send it. All right, if you don't know, that's Larry the Enticer. He is a true hoser from the land up north, my second favorite country of Canada. You need to know, believe it or not, that viral video came out in 2017, not like 1997, it's just recent. But the idea of send it has become common, at least to a lot of my younger friends in their everyday language, it's even become common in the chatter at our little league games that if you're batting or you're pitching, we're cheering our teammates on saying, come on now, it's time to send it. It originates from a climbing term. To send or to send was to make a, a full climb without slipping, falling, or even resting, that you were, it was a send. Or uh, also from extreme sports, the idea of a full send would be going for it in, in skateboarding or in BMX bike riding. And by the way, have you ever wondered how those people get so good at what they do? There had to be some injuries, right? They just go for it. They just do whatever it takes to learn and go. So I showed Larry the enticer to Pastor Nicholas, who's here today. You'll hear from him a little later. And I said, Nicholas, what do you think? And he goes, what does send it mean? Does it mean go for it? And I said, you got it. So that's what we're going to use as our definition as we work through the slang term send it. Go for it. Go for it. So I want to welcome everybody that's a part of Living Water this morning, whether you're, whether you're watching online or whether you're at our Maslin campus or at the Dalton campus. And I just want to welcome you to what God's doing in our church. We're in this thing together in multiple locations. God's at work. We're a movement. And I need to share with you from the very beginning, Living Water was a church that's just going to send it. They were just going to go for it. From the small group of people who gathered 30-some years ago in a junior high band room and said it's time to, to start a church, we're built on this idea of moving forward and of taking a next step and taking risk. So Living Water, my, my call today to all of us is let's live with an understanding that there may be difficult things that arise. It's hard to move forward in your faith. There's obstacles, but it doesn't matter. We're going to send it. We're going to send it. And by the way, I hope you know we're talking about a whole lot larger things than uh, ramping snowmobiles, right? I'm not Going for it, you think about it, they ought to be. James addresses this in the book of James. And I'd love for you to turn there. Whether you have your Bible, whether it's a digital device, James chapter 2, as always, I want you to look into the scripture uh, for yourselves to see what's there, to be able to go back and look at it later. It'll be on the screen if you don't have anything, but, but I want you to be a part of, of what we're, we're talking about this morning. As you turn to James 2, a couple things you need to know. In the book of James, the author James is very direct. He's very blunt. He just says things as he, per, as he sees them, this truth that has come through. Uh, by the way, he knows a lot about Jesus because he was Jesus' brother. He was a leader in the early church when there's a lot of big decisions to make. He helped make those decisions on the course of the church. But he just puts the truth out there in a very clear way. If you're at a place in life right now where you don't know what book of the Bible to read or where you could look in the, in, in the scriptures, look at James. It's just some clear, really good truth. So James... A 
looking for an answer from you. I'm going to pause. It's not rhetorical. I want you to answer. And uh, I'll do that as many times as it takes so we can, we can get an answer. But l- listen to this. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Now, that's not bad. Let's try that again. Retor- it's not rhetorical, meaning you need an answer to this question as I pause. Maslin Camp is the same thing. Here we go. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters? Are you getting your answer ready? What good is it, dear brothers and sisters? If- we can't. Now listen to this. It's kind of a, a scenario and then one final question. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has found who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? It doesn't do anything. It does nothing for them. So you see, this is James continuing on, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith? Even the demons believe this, and they tremble with terror. How foolish, can't, how foolish can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his, his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we're shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them from safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. James writes this. He writes this entire letter, but he writes this passage because he is seeing and he is sensing an issue within the church that I believe is still very much alive today and needs battled. And that issue is simply this, that faith all by itself, faith that's just an understanding, really isn't faith at all. Faith is bigger than that. Faith has to be bigger than that. People aren't acting on their faith. He starts to see this. Listen, this faith in Jesus, who James knew so well, produces action in us. We must move. We must move. But that's not the faith that is practiced so much. You see, we don't practice a faith that invests in the important things of God, that pays the cost to invest in those things. We don't have a faith that's willing to take risk and to step out and to be obedient We don't have a faith that's a go-for-it faith. We more have a faith like, okay, if you're going to pull me along, I might come. James is shouting out. I'm just going to read into it. Don't you see? We just got to send it. We just got to go for it. We got to make these things happen and take action. There needs to be that action. So as we talk about this, though, I want to pause for a moment, just come back a little bit, and just help us understand and remind us about our theology of salvation, our understanding of salvation. That we are saved, we are rescued by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. In fact, in Ephesians 2, it says it's for grace that you are saved, not of yourself, not of your works, so that you, can, you can't boast. Our faith, our salvation comes from Jesus. And, and one thing that's really important, I, this is going to sound strange, but I need to tell you this, there is no cosmic brownie point system. And I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with people where they believe, they won't say it this way, they think there's a cosmic brownie point system. That if I do enough good and that outweighs the bad things I've done, then God will probably let me in. That is an answer that even people within the church give. But the reality is there's nothing we can do. There's no work we can do that can um, overcome the sin and brokenness that plagues our lives as we're on this earth. Only Jesus could when he gave his life up. He gave his life for us, and that's where salvation comes from. So what's James communicating? James is saying when you recognize the value, the importance, the power of what Jesus did, then there's no way you can be the same, and that has to, you have to respond. It has to overflow out of you. So you've got an understanding. It's by faith you've said to Jesus, yes, I want you to lead my life. If that's happened to you in reality, then things are going to go different in the actions of your life. And if it doesn't, James is pretty blunt. Then I don't think you're a believer at all. 
There's no such thing as a head knowledge faith or a rescuing faith in Jesus that's only through uh, your understanding. Action and good deeds demonstrate that faith. So we need some examples, and so James gives a couple, and I think they're worthwhile for us to take a little uh, deeper look at. And so Abraham is one of those, and many of you might know the story of Abraham. Some of you, this might be brand new. Good. It comes out of Genesis chapter 22. Abraham's story is all throughout Genesis, but in Genesis chapter 2, there's the story of Abraham and what happened. You see, Abraham and Sarah were an older couple whom God had come to Abraham and promised and said, I want to make you a great nation. You're going to be the father of my people. And the only problem was Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 and they didn't have any children. And so they prayed and God said that he would bless them and he did. And they had a child, which was miraculous. We might say a mistake in these days, right? If you're 100, no. It was a miracle, right? It was a miracle. And they were so thrilled with what God had given. They loved their son Isaac. It was this incredible gift. And there's this moment where God says to Abraham, I need you to give Isaac back to me. And not just, the, not, just, um, not just as an idea or dedicate him to service, but I need you to give Isaac back to me by sacrificing his life to me. Now, as I talk about that for a moment, let me just say this, that the idea of sacrificing children in that day and age was familiar. It was not something that happened often, but it was familiar. It was something that uh, Abraham would have understood, but Abraham clearly did not want to do this but he walked in obedience with God anyway. And so he took all the things that he needed, the altar that he needed to build, and he goes up to the mountain. And on the way, you see this part of the story, go back and read Genesis 22 this week and see this story. But as he is walking and knowing what God's asked him to do, his son Isaac said, I see all this stuff that for the sacrifice, dad, but what are we going to sacrifice? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. The Lord's gonna give us what we need and they walk on. Abraham takes his son up the mountain. He lays them on the altar to strike him dead. And God stops him in that moment. God stops him. It says in the scripture that God knew that he would hold nothing back from him. It was this faith. It was this understanding that he would take action, even at great cost to himself. And in that moment, Abraham, God said, stop. And he looked over, and there was a ram in the thicket, a ram caught in the thicket. I need to tell you something. I go hunting a lot, and I've never seen a big buck caught in the thicket. It just does not happen, okay? There's a ram in the thicket, that's what he sacrifices, and it's this incredible story of Abraham taking action in what God said, even when it was the most difficult thing that God could ever ask. So this is the first thing I want you to write down this morning as we talk about action. God rewards action, not talk. God rewards action, not talk. As a result of what Abraham does, God says to him, you have obeyed me, you haven't withheld anything, I'm gonna make you into a great nation, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna bless your family. Let me just comment on, this is such a a difficult story for me, let me just comment for a moment that the story of God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son can easily be misunderstood as the story of a cruel and mean and unloving God. But when you look deeper into the story, what you find, it's this incredible story of faith and love that Abraham had enough faith to listen to God even when he didn't understand, and that God used this story, the story is to foreshadow what God was was going to do with his only son, and he was gonna take his only son and sacrifice him for the forgiveness of our sin. The only difference was no one stopped God. He had to give his son up. And I love the foreshadowing of the story and what it means. It's an incredible story of love and action. God rewards that action of Abraham, not talk. The second story was Rahab, the prostitute. By the way, have you ever introduced your friend? Hey, this is my friend Rahab. She's a prostitute. I don't think you have. All right? It's this this categorization of her and who she is and, and, and what her life was like. But listen, Rahab was honored because she chose action. You see, she was, in the land, she was in the city of Jericho and she had heard about the, the nation of the Israelites 40 years before who had walked through the Red Sea on dry ground and who had wandered through the desert all these years and anytime somebody attacked them, they won the victory. She had heard that just recently they crossed over the Jordan River that it, uh, was in flood stage but they crossed over on dry ground and she knew they were coming and something within her, she knew that these people had the God that was real that could be trusted. Two spies from Israel show up in her city She takes them in. When the king finds out there's spies in the city, they come to Rahab and they say, where where are these spies? And she says, I don't know, they were here and they left. All the while, she's hiding them in the roof. 
She's taking a huge risk. She keeps them for the night. She sends them away. It's the story of her stepping out and taking action, not just saying that God must be real, but taking action in it. And let me tell you something. God blessed her. God blesses action, not talk. God rewards that. And if you look at the story of Jesus and the royal line, the royal family of David, then on to Jesus, you will find that the great, 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 grandmother, or something like that, is Rahab, not the prostitute, but Rahab, the mother of the family of Jesus. God transforms her through that. Her life changes. She's rewarded because of the action that she takes. As I think about what God is saying to us, I know that every single one of us in this room has a story of taking action, of having faith, of stepping forward some way, some shape, some form. I know it. But if you're like me, and for a moment you would be transparent, and I wanna do that with you, I would say this. I've got some stories, but I have too few stories. Why don't I have more? Why don't I have more stories? I know there's missed opportunities. And by the way, as you sit in here, you will probably think of missed opportunities that you have. And here's what I want to say is, listen, I is it that I have fewer stories than I could have about stepping out in faith and action. It's one word. It all boils. As I thought about all the different things in my life and people that have talked to me and experiences that I've seen or had myself, it all boils down to one word. Why don't we step out in action more often? Why don't we take that? It boils down to the word fear. Every single piece of it. And God clearly understands that, and that's probably why the number one command in Scripture is do not be afraid, do not fear. 365 times. In fact, as we go through this, if you see yourself as somebody who struggles with this fear and can't move forward, there's some devotionals out there each day, 365 days, a different scripture about fear and learning from that and incorporating that into your life. But fear is what keeps us, it's the root at what keeps us from moving in action. Fear that I don't have enough resources, don't have enough time, I don't have enough money. If I give it away, I won't have enough, not enough energy, emotional energy to take this on. Fear of the fact that if I step out and do something, what will that mean for a long-term commitment to, for me? Will I get roped into this? It might be the fear of the unknown. Where will this take me? It might be just be the fear of interrupting your normal pattern. I like life the way it is. I really don't want it to change. But there's these fears that keep us from action. But in order to live in action rather than in words, you must place outcome above fear. Write that down. You must place outcome above above fear. And what I mean by that is you've got to see the potential of what the action can produce, what can happen when you move, specifically what can happen when you move as a result of, of, of understanding and hearing God when he's asked something or creates an opportunity. You need to see something that's not there yet. You need to have a vision. You need to see potential that can come. You need to picture success. And that's the reason, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, or the world, I mean, people don't move unless there's a sense of success or a picture of the future, a preferred picture of the future. All right, we'll take the risk. The ultimate outcome, though, isn't just taking a risk where we see good things happening, where God could do something to change somebody's life. The ultimate outcome of the success is not defined by our picture of what we would hope would happen. The ultimate outcome is we simply begin to understand that anytime we move in obedience to God, there is great reward for that. Whether it looks like a failure, whether people would categorize it as a failure or great success, there's a great reward in that. And ultimately, we have to land in that place that says, I'm willing to take action so I can walk with God in what he's doing. Let me tell you a, a story uh, that best defines it for me. I had a good friend here at Living Water, who owned a small business. One day he was driving through town, and as he drove through town, he looked up under a bridge. There was an overpass. He looks under the bridge, sees somebody up there, keeps on going. But as he went a little further, he goes, that really looks like a former employee of mine. So he circles back around, and he stops, and he goes and has a conversation. Sure enough, it was Brian, his former employee. And he talks with Brian about what's happened in life and addiction, and he's lost his family. He has no job. He has nothing. And he says to Brian... Um, do you want things to change? Because if you do, I've got a place for you. I want you to come be, you know, at my house. And Brian said yes, and my friend moved him into his barn. But I need you to know the barn was really a man cave. It had a pool table and a TV. You know, I, I'd actually like to live there. But it was, a, it was a great place for him. 
But over a period of nine months, he um, got some part-time work here and there. He got himself weaned off and then free of, of the addictions that he had. He got the money to be able to pay all the fines that he had to get his license back. Partway through this scenario, my friend invited me to be a part of it. He's like, there's some things I can't get done. Will you help me? I was like, sure. One of the final pieces for Brian in his journey was getting his driver's license. I took him to four tests, and the fourth one he passed it. I'm like, yes. As soon as he got his license, about four days later, it was a Monday. He started in a new job where he drove uh, construction. He drove for the crew, and then he helped in construction. After one week and his first paycheck, it, you know, it's celebration time. Man, you're, you're making it. As soon as he was paid, he disappeared. And we didn't see him for another week. And eventually he found himself back to that same bridge and he just gave up. And I remember my friend looking at me and saying, we, what did I do wrong? What could have been different? Man, did I not pray enough? Did I not share enough with them? What, 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 what is this? And as we sat there and thought about it for a minute, there was just a clear impression that I had as we talked as I said, listen, there was nothing that you did wrong. You chose to take the risk and join in with what God asked you to do. And what God asked you to do was give Brian one more clear chance. And you know what? The God of the universe loves us so deeply, he'll give Brian another chance. But right then it was our job to give a chance. And the outcome did not go the way that I'd hoped or anybody who knew about it had hoped. But I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there was great success because it was obedience to what God was doing in the moment. So I want to share with you, as you step out and take the risk, more often than not, you're going to see the successes that you're hoping for. You really will. God will move. But I also want you to know when you do this, and maybe you've done it in the past. I've tried this before. It didn't work out very well. If you're obedient to God, it's success. It's success. So you must place that outcome above your fear. So I want to give you another story, but the best person to tell the story is Nicholas himself. So Nicholas, grab that mic, come on up. I asked him just to share a little bit about the faith steps he's taking, the faith steps that we're about to take together and just share with us. Hallelujah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. Sometimes my, my mind, I want to say many things, but in my mouth is not good, you know. <laughs> I try to say, I have many things to tell you, but yeah. Just I want to say this. Well, when I see the video, uh, uh, in my mind is go for it. Like, just don't think. Just go and do something great. And, and I know the great things is happen in the church and, and here. And we're going to do a great things. Um, I am a 41 years old. I know I look more younger, but yeah, and I, also I have a gray hair. Uh, but in my in my twenties, I remember when I started the, the free church in the mountain of the Michoacan, and I take the risk. God called me to plant the, the only is the only one church right right there in that place, and I take the risk, and God opened the doors in different ways, and God. Uh, it's amazing. We have an amazing God. And now God called me to go to the United States. And when I come into the United States, um, I was in one Mexican restaurant and I was there. Many people, when I, I was in Morelia, they told me, why are you going to the United States? Why? Look to the church. Look to your family. Why are you going? But, you know, I feel in my heart I need to go because I need to do something more, you know. So I was here and, I, and God opened the doors one more time and gave me the opportunity to meet him, Pastor Mark. When we walk in faith, God opened the doors and sometimes you don't know how or when. But when we walk in faith, God is going to do because our God is a great God. Maybe you don't have the, the, the you, maybe I don't have the language. <laughs> but God is going to me, give me the, the, the grace, and the wisdom to talk your language. <laughs> in the right moment, in the right time, 
I was seated, I was working in that restaurant and my friend, he was there. And Pastor Dan was there. So why I'm doing this, why I'm here, why I'm, why I come into the United States to establish a new church, why? I don't have the language. What you are doing? Some of my friends in Mexico, they told me, oh, you know what? You have a, the Bible school right now. You have a nice church. Thank you. We have a nice church in Morelia. Thank you for you. But they, they say, what are you going? You can go for every city in Mexico and plant a new church fast. But you know what? God called me to come in the U.S. To come and, and find the Hispanic people around here in Wayne County. So why I'm doing this? Because God called me to do this. I honor to God. This is honor. I honor to God for what He's doing in my life. And I want to honor also the life of Pastor Mark and Pastor Dan. For honor, I'm going to be obedient. And I want to tell you this, Pastor Mark. For honor to how, who you are, I honor your life. And, and I said you are my pastor. When you honor someone, great things is going to happen. We honor to God. And, and in this moment, I want to say I honor Pastor Mark because he opened the doors for this church. We was the church in the streets. We have many, five years ago, almost six years ago, we are spread the gospel in the street. And I honor your life because open the doors and now we have a new church in Morelia. But we're going to have a Hispanic church here in Wayne County. Amen. So we are par for this. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> We're going to launch our first campus in Maslin. And Nicholas has been there, and it's, it's, it's so good what the Lord is lining up in the midst of this. And I have Nicholas share with you because he's an example of a, a big step of moving his entire family here so this can all begin. But I need you to know that whatever the Lord's calling to you, big or small, you just move in that in action. And especially, sometimes we think what, what we may need to do is only small. It's not. There's no small step when you're faithful. I want to take you to one more scripture as we finish up. James chapter 2, verse 26 at the end. It's, 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 it almost felt like an afterthought, but it's so key to this whole passage. Verse 24. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. I need you to know if you're feeling like your faith is, is apathetic or if it's empty or it's just getting uh, blah, or if you feel like it's, it's dying or dwindling or dead, I need you to know there is a way to have your faith become strong again and that's to choose to step out in action in what God's calling you to do. And my guess is you know what it is. Step out and take action and your faith comes alive. You can write this down. Last thing, your awakening is one obedient action away. Your awakening, your faith, your revival in who you are is one obedient action away, whatever it is the Lord's calling you to. There's nothing big, there's nothing small. They're all incredibly important and we just have to go for it. And I'm so grateful to be able to pastor with, uh, partner with Pastor Nicholas, who God has brought into our lives as a church and it's launching that we had a great night last night at the Maslin campus, just gathering core members together. Here's what I know about that though, we're in process. And I know that uh, I've shared with you the vision of this to reach Hispanic people, those who are undervalued, overlooked. Pastor Nicholas would say that they're living in darkness. We just wanna invite them out into community and life. We're part way there. There's some things I'm gonna ask you as, as we talked about the message this morning, it had a whole lot to do with how do you take action personally? But for just a moment, let me talk about how we can take action as community and make a difference. There's two things I'll say. The first is pray.
pray, talk about it. Talk about it to God, pray to him, ask him to, 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 for, for great success in what we're accomplishing, what we're trying to accomplish. But talk to others as well about the excitement of what's coming. But here's the second part. As a church, we need to resource this. Everything that this costs is over and above our regular budget, and I'm asking you to give over and above. And as I presented this a while back, I've had a lot of conversations with people who said, uh, yeah, we're figuring out what we wanna do. I want every single person who calls Living Water their home to participate in this, whether it's $10 or $100 or $1,000. So far, 26 families or 26 people who give have given to it. We have about $15,000 that's been matched. We have about 30,000. We've got about 70,000 to go. Let's put it together. People, let's all be a part of it. Let's invest in something that matters eternally. I'm really grateful for the 20 or 25 people so far have committed to be part of the core team. But as an end result, let's look down the road of hundreds of people giving their lives to Jesus Christ, not just in our Hispanic church, but across the board, of people being baptized, of us being a part of the call of God. So I ask you to do that. The next couple of weeks, is our deadline is June 9th. Our deadline is June 9th for giving. If you want to give, there's envelopes in the, in the back. There's envelopes in the lobby at Maslin. You can give online. You can give on the app. But it's time for us to invest in something big. If you would, will you stand with me right now, both campuses? Will you stand with me? I want to be a church of action. I want to live out the legacy that God has given us. We're a church of action. We move and we grow and we go. We do that personally. We do that corporately as a church. But you can't leave today without figuring out your step of action. I'll put this on the screen so you can see it. The bottom line today is what is your act of obedience? What is it today for you? Figure that out. Move in it. Walk in it. Let me pray with you. God, you are so good. We trust you. We know that you're gonna move. We know that you always move when we move. You do something good, and we just wanna be a part of that. We pray, Jesus, that you will launch this Hispanic campus into great success of rescuing people, of bringing people to you, of discipling people. We pray, Jesus, that each of us will be faithful in what you called us, will act, will step out, whatever that looks like. God, we want to be your church, the church of action. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
part of something that God is doing and growing and pushing forward. Isn't that exciting? Are you guys excited? Because I'm excited. One group that loves a movement is the next generation. So here, coming up next week is Next Gen Sunday. You're going to want to be here. It's awesome that we get to celebrate the next generation here at Living Water. So until then, have a great week. We'll see you guys next Sunday. <laughs>